Yes, way to represent, way to model authenticity in all of our movings and beings and our inquiry. I'm so ex excited about this next conversation that's happening. It's been pure comedy in the back. Before we get to it, I want to just invite you all, I want to invite you to move to take care of yourself and to come closer. And I'm wondering, is anyone excited about the party tonight? Yeah, it's like 15 food trucks and two live bands and, you know, cocktailing and all of that under that glorious full moon. Did anyone else enjoy the full moon the way I did last night? Just, yes, in her largeness, her wonderfulness. And there's also these great book signings that are happening today. If you haven't stopped by the bookstore or connected with any of the authors, I know uh, Vikram is signing, is, uh, signing his new book. Uh, Edgar Villanueva also. My sister friend Morgan Simon and Marianne Schnall are all doing book signings at the bookstore today. So please stop by and purchase their book, meet them, talk with them. And I'm just, um, I'm excited about that. And I'm excited about the new conversations that are bubbling up, that always bubble up here at SOCAP. And, you know, if you want to start a conversation or you see something or thinking about now or over the past years that hasn't been brought up, this is your time. This is your opportunity. I'm part of a, a group of folks who seven years ago started thinking about a project called Impact Hub Oakland. That was actually uh, a business that is thriving in Oakland, California, that was really sparked from a conversation here. So I know that you know, the juices are flowing here, the opportunity, the sparks are here. We are the sparks. So this, this title of this conversation uh, says, Cross-Sector Collaboration for Lasting Impact in Racial Equity. We decided to rename it in the back to Zombies, polar bears, and racial equity. I want to tell you why. It's because these particular, these four speakers are way out there in their innovation. <laughs> and they're laughing in the back, way out there. We, I, let me just start with the moderator. The moderator this morning is Cynthia Mueller. She's the director of mission investments at the Kellogg Foundation. Y'all clap it up for the Kellogg Foundation. For the past few years here at SOCAP, the, the conversation on racial equity has been put front and center, really laid bare. And uh, Cynthia is, is part of this team. They have made a commitment to where the conversation, the lens of racial equity is across all of their programs. In fact, they call the program their DNA. And so that's what has to be part of how we begin this conversation by uh, really honoring and celebrating who we are and what we know, and coming and meeting each other at the place where we are at. And so when I asked her about her background, she said, oh, a Native Alaskan. And I said, what, what does that mean? And you know, she's like, well, it means First Nations, Indigenous, that I come from the, the, the background or the identity of the folks who are uh, Nupak and Haidea. And I said, well, this is a really beautiful opportunity. And so she's going to be leading this conversation with uh, Dibati uh, Rohati, Deepti, I'm sorry, Deepti Rohati, as well as Dwayne Marsh and Napoleon Wallace. A little bit about each of them. Deepti is the head of Slack for Good and Public Affairs at Slack. I asked her what was bringing her joy, and she said, of course, my kids. And when I asked, which is always a wonderful answer to hear from parents, but when I asked her if she had stopped at the installation out front and the question of being, what is it that you love and hope to never lose due to climate change, she said polar bears. And then we got into this conversation on, well, that's like the quintessential answer when we talk about polar bears. But when I asked what does racial equity look like at Slack, she said it looks like empathy and then drop this, this beautiful jewel that says, no one person is you know, the full truth. And so I thank you for, for holding that space today. Duane Marsh serves as the VP of Institutional and Sectoral Change at Race Forward. You all might know that Race Forward just joined uh, forces with the Center for Social Inclusion. And so his work 
you know, is really around the collective soul and his hope that we don't lose that to climate change. And so he's going to be talking uh, a lot about his work in that sector. And then I have Napoleon Wallace, who I just met, activist, co-founder, and lives in Durham, North Carolina, and grew up in a town of 120 folks. I was like, really? That's what I'm talking about, graduate of an HBCU, and also hopes that he doesn't lose his town. You know, what are we going to lose to climate change as the water shifts, as the, as the wind shifts, as the land shifts, and as we acclimate to what is happening on the planet? And so, you know, that kind of conversation is important for us to have, but I also want to like center the conversation around joy. And he is excited about their particular social justice lens around the municipal bond sector and asking questions again, why did Ferguson happen? Why do these uprisings happen? What happens in protest? And so join me in work welcoming Cynthia Mueller, Dibati Rohati, Dwayne Marsh, and Napoleon Wallace to SOCAP 2018. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, and uh, I'm Cynthia Muller. I'm so excited to be here. I'm generally excited if you know me, generally, but uh, I'm really excited to be here and, and, and moderating this conversation about uh, collaboration and, and how to promote lasting racial equity. I think I just want to sit on a moment. Actually, we were having a very good time back there, I think with all the donuts. Um, uh, we're deep, deep in a moment of, of prep for this you know, said, there is no one holder of truth. Like, just sit on that. And when we think about what we know and what we understand as investors, as social enterprises, as companies, how do we determine what truth actually means? And so when we're, we're talking about racial equity and collaboration, we're talking about how do we change systems. And in changing systems, it's about creating options. And how do you get to options? You have to go outside your own sphere of, of, of relationships and networks and influence. And that's really uncomfortable um, for, many, for, many, for many reasons, especially as we are all working in, in this space and trying to um, uh, establish deep and meaningful change for the communities we most care about. And so I want to start off um, with you, Deepti, in terms, in terms of talking about what um, Slack for Good has been doing with uh, the last mile and returning citizens. I mean, Slack is an incredibly successful company, and what are they doing uh, bringing in returning citizens to code? Sure, sure. So um, in general, Slack, if you don't know, we're an enterprise software company. Um, we build software that hopefully makes your working life more pleasant, productive, and productive. Um, the next chapter program is a program where we are taking three formerly incarcerated individuals and training them to be engineers at Slack through a one-year-long apprenticeship program. We've been working on this for about three years, um, and we build enterprise software. We are not experts um, in racial equity, nor would we ever claim to be, and that's why we have wonderful partners like the Kellogg Foundation, The Last Mile, and John Legend's Free America, helping us figure out how to structure a thoughtful, um, equitable, and sustainable program. Our goal for this program is really threefold. The first is to create honestly, high-paying job opportunities for those individuals who are formerly incarcerated. Secondarily is to shift perceptions about the capabilities of these individuals who have um, committed a crime, but still have amazing, amazing talents. And finally is to create a blueprint for other technology companies on how they can hire um, from this underrepresented population within, within our communities. So that's really what we're working on. Our apprentices start on Monday. Um, we're very excited to welcome them to Slack. Yeah, that's great. Napoleon, can you talk about the, the founding of activists and what you all are really focusing on, the mini bond piece, and, and, and specifically talk about kind of how you saw the different systems, um, particularly with the rating systems, and how that really has informed how you guys are developing this product. Absolutely. So um, one way to start that conversation is to talk a little bit about kind of what the municipal bond market is. So municipal bond market for folks that, you know, uh, don't have depth of knowledge in that. It's a four trillion dollar social kind of public good market that undergirds not just our 
uh, local economies, but our uh, you know kind of local communities, and in many ways, kind of our society. Uh, and this market, despite its size, it's a debt market. Despite its size has really been immune to some of the impact, uh, we'd say ESG sort of risk considerations that have shown up in a lot of other places in the traditional sort of investment market as well as in the traditional uh, sort of or equity market as well as in the traditional sort of fixed income uh, market. And we think that you know, a lot of that has had to do with this increased separation of what we call the citizen bondholder. So if you think about over the past 40 years, the folks that used to invest in municipal bonds when it was a $250 million market, uh, or $250 billion market, uh, the folks that were investing back then, they were locals that knew the investments, were going to be impacted by those investments, yeah. and in many ways had the kind of foresight to know that if they chose to have some erosive or extractive sort of interest around their, the way that they got their money back, that that would affect the communities they were investing in. And what we've seen is as this, as this space has grown between the investor and the citizen, the citizen investor, that we've also created this dissonance of how the dollars going into a community have affected the people in those community and what the community has been willing to do to get its money to pay back the bondholders who in many ways have become the principals. Um, it's a bit of an agency issue that we see. Uh, this is how Ferguson happens. And they say, let's take 25%, let, let's get 25% of our revenue to pay back general obligation bonds from fines and fees, aggressive uh, sort of pursuit, civil forfeiture of individuals, and then you have the outcomes, and you have the interactions and the outcomes like you have in a community like that. It's how we get a, uh, a flint where you have these, a community that is trying to find a way, well, there, there was a little bit of, we'll say there, there, there's current conversation about whether there was uh, some fraud associated with that, mm -hmm. but there wasn't an, a G in the ESG kind of placed on that community. And so activists and what we do is we are a uh, municipal bond research fund that tries to integrate ESG, social justice, as well as an advocacy voice uh, in communities where we recognize that as folks are trying to pay back the bondholders or improve fiscal outcomes, in many cases, the places where those dollars are mined from are the participants and citizens and residents of a community that are the most vulnerable yeah. and least able to speak up for themselves. And how, just one quick follow-up, so in building out this product, what types of partnerships have you had to lay or to, to establish to really start to develop this product, to really understand the municipal bonds? I mean, is it, is it just activists? Is it, you know, folks that you've just met in the field? Like, how has that played out? Absolutely. So, I mean, the municipal bond market, we're trying to affect change in a very large market yeah. that has been around for a really long time and has traditional market forces like any other market. And so the ways in which we've had to do that is oh, you can only get that done through collaboration. Yep. And that's collaboration with a number of partners that are engaged at every level. So we have engaged with banks who are issuing because we can tell them the company that you are, the, the, the place where you're about to make an issuance, there is some risk there that you want to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. And that could affect the pricing of the bond and probably should affect the pricing of that bond. We have the uh, similar relationships with local municipalities where we're going into municipalities and talking with leadership and saying, we recognize that you all don't see this as a current issue and we also recognize that your debt holder, or not debt holder, the ratings agency doesn't necessarily see this as a critical issue immediately because they normally think over a two year time horizon. But this is a five to 10 year issue that if you don't deal with, yeah. it will come back to bite and it will cost you kind of like your fiscal strength as a municipality. And that's only come from all of those sorts of partnerships. That's right. that's great. I think it's really interesting when you think about partnerships and the work that all of us do. I mean. Mm -hmm. All of us are pushing the boundaries on how we are building out these programs, and I think for, it comes from a place of humbleness, mm -hmm. yeah. of none of us are the sole source of truth. None of us yeah. know the answer, and without strong partnerships and additional perspectives, none of us can accomplish anything that we're trying to. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah.
Dwayne. Yes. Tell us about GARE, what you guys have been up to. You're all over the country. You've got this incredible network. Yes, yeah, so uh, we don't usually associate movement and movement building with government. Uh, in fact, a lot of people think of that as a place that innovation goes to retire, if not worse, right? <laughs> but we've seen different, uh, a new generation of jurisdictions that are looking for solutions. They're trying to new approaches to get different results for the communities they serve. And when it comes to interrogating the most critical issues, jobs, education, housing, criminal justice, inevitably when we deep dig into that, it comes back to race. Yeah. And the question is, what do we do about that? You name an aspect, that could be in an audience with 15 departments from an, a, an agent, a, a jurisdiction, every department will look at their outcomes, disparities by race, literally life to death, life expectancy, infant mortality. These things aren't natural, right? They don't occur because, just because. We have right. to figure out why they happen and, un, and really resolve that. Why we formed GARE, Government Alliance on Race and Equity, it's a membership le network that's driven by members. It really pushes the question on how do we not just recognize that racial inequities have to be addressed, but take action. And so we put those theories in, into practice. We uh, provide service to that network. We support the individual members. We share practices that are promising. We look at how we can actually do subject area driven action, including issues like sustainability. And we look at solidarity because this, even though there are now dozens, scores of jurisdictions around the country doing it, it could be lonely work. Institutional transformation is hard. So whether it's the Twin Cities looking at how they close their skills gap mm -hmm. and not being able to have a workforce because of the differences in African American and, and other races and whites in terms of their outcomes around uh, job attainment. If it's looking at Charlotte, they're looking at their land use patterns and how they do planning for the future that's really more equitable. Whether it's looking at Albuquerque where they're trying to figure out how do we actually make our procurement more equitable so people can participate in that economy. Or a place like Seattle where a lot of this work emerged really trying to go to maturity and figure out how to sustain the work. We try to support all these places. Yeah. Ultimately, it's about institutional transformation, really positioning jurisdictions to take on just about anything. Yeah. And I can already see that, you know, the possibilities, even in the agreement, we we're talking about some of the partnership possibilities. But really, it's because while we really can't change our systems and our society without government, government can't do it alone. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the theory of change we have around this work. What? One follow-up. I mean, so when you are, when someone approaches you and you know has an idea or a seed of an idea, what do you all recommend in terms of what's in place in order for a partnership or initiative to move forward? Like, what in your in your experience? We really are trying to figure out how jurisdictions can normalize the conversation on race, build shared analysis, but also hold at the same time this duality of the need for urgency, right? Because this took hundreds of years to get here, you know, oh, it's going to take us hundreds of years to fix. People's lives are at stake. We don't have that kind of time. Right. And so how you hold that urgency and look at the long game, critically important. We try to operationalize systems, use data and tools, and there actually are racial equity tools that jurisdictions can apply to figure out how you can get a different set of results with the programs you run. And then there's organizing. And that's not just organizing. We usually think of that as the community organizing against the institution because they feel the institution has right. failed them. But organizing within our jurisdictions across silos and, again, um, bridging into a new arena as well. And then recognizing that we need new relationships with community that aren't just about input or even engagement. It's leadership, ownership, uh, co-design of these processes. Yeah. yeah. DJ, you talked about uh, uh, the humility that Slack ha had yeah. to have in order to develop this program. Talk about that point when you realized that uh, Slack couldn't do it alone and that you didn't yeah. have all the answers. And what did that end up looking like when you were on search of kind of setting up the partnership? Sure. I mean, I, I, we're, we're pretty honest about our failures at Slack. It's something that um, we, we talk about. And so this program we've been working on for three years. So. Um, I took our CEO to San Quentin to last mile almost three years ago, um, and we were just blown away by what the program was building, the, the passion, the intelligence, the commitment of the students that we met, and we tried to um, hire one of their first graduates. So we were so inspired, we gave this one gentleman, um, and he's okay with me using his name, Ali Tambora, um, a stipend when he was released. We sent him to Hack Reactor and we tried to hire him. And it wasn't enough. We, we thought that the coding skills that we were able to give him would be enough to have him work and thrive at Slack. Mm -hmm. And I think when he didn't pass the interview, we realized, oh my goodness, it's not as simple as we wanted it to be. And then we reached out to Kellogg, knowing that it's a much broader, much more systematic issue we were trying to solve for, to really think about how do we build a program that addresses some of these major systemic issues? Mm -hmm. um, 
and to build it and work with our partners and to structure the program correctly. And then the last mile, obviously working with Kellogg and then with Free America when we think about how to shift perceptions around this community. So it was very humbling to say we tried. It's not going to be as easy as we wanted it to be and we're going to need a lot of help. Mm -hmm. um, and thankfully, mm -hmm. um, the Kellogg Foundation stepped up and has been honestly just a gift in telling us how to, how to think about these issues. Um, but it was humbling. It was definitely humbling. We're like, wow, this is going to take a lot more work than we thought. Well, and I think for, from, just to jump in on from the Kellogg perspective, I think what was really, it was, uh, it was humbling from our perspective because working with, you know, an organization like Slack that has um, tremendous respect here, um, here in the Valley, and, you know, and, in, and the number of people that and customers that it actually reaches and realizing here is an immediate need. We as this large institution with our processes that, you know, might be a little slower than Sometimes. what you guys Sometimes. do over there at Slack. It was incredibly helpful and insightful for our team to see how quickly you all can mobilize, but also how we need to step up as well and be able to, mm -hmm. to respond to these opportunities. Yeah. I mean, there, it's, it's, a, it's a good balance, right? We need one million engineers. Wow. And there are two yeah. million formerly or incarcerated individuals. It's, it's, it's yeah. math. Talent is equally distributed. Yeah. There are some very talented folks yeah. Um, yeah. who are incarcerated. <laughs> so they should be making some money. Yeah. yeah. Napoleon, so what I, I, the, the, the product that you all are building yeah. is incredible. Um, especially when you think about the history as you shared the, mm -hmm. in the Muni market. And I think about the, the, the rating systems and, and um, the assumptions that they've mm -hmm. made over time. And you shared a little anecdote with me backstage. Can you talk a little bit more about um, how this field is ripe for change and how you all are mobilizing um, for those, those, individual those individual investments? Absolutely. So there, there's some great, you know, um, there's a lot of great empirical research on the municipal bond market in terms of uh, things that actually matter in fiscal outcomes and then the difference between that and things that are considered uh, important to ratings agencies. So, you know, one example in uh, 1968, we stopped redlining in housing, like, you know, Fair Housing Act. It wasn't until about 20 years later that we stopped including race as a consideration in uh, local municipal ratings. I mean, and, and those are tied together. Housing values do affect mm -hmm. municipal bond, you know, kind of fiscal outcomes, municipal fiscal outcomes. But there are all these sorts of like nuggets like that that we don't think a lot of folks are looking at. One of the things that we've really been, that we really found in the development of this is we started out with this idea that we need to bring ESG and ESG lens, risk perspective. My background is around that work, high yield investments. Yeah. Like, how do you bring ESG to the municipal bond market? We recognize that there are significant exposures around environment. We can be pretty clear about how those are impacting. I'm from a state that just had two 50-year hurricanes in a three-year period. So, you know, we recognize that resilience matters a lot. Uh, and there are bonds girding that. Um, we have seen on the social piece that the way you treat your uh, residents and your employees really matters in terms of talent you're able to retain, the engagement when something like OPEB comes up, as in it, like how you deal with that, uh, as well as the communication and relationship between your community members and you know, yeah. uh, the city. And then on the governance piece, any sort of governance issue has massive uh, yeah. sort of negative outcomes. So we, we've already seen that that matters, but the place we're trying to go now is that we believe that that's not enough. Sunlight disinfects, we get that, that's really important, but just knowing ESG risk without some sort of mobilization around it right. isn't enough. Yeah. In the corporate market, when you look at equities, folks recognize what a risk is. They'll say, you know, there's a significant risk of the CEO being the board chair. Right. And an entire community of investors have galvanized around that issue and made a point of ensuring that in the companies they're invested in, that that's not happening. Yeah. 
in the municipal bond market, you have things that are just as important, just as critical to fiscal health, but there's no galvanizing community right. of investors, community members, local elected officials, otherwise, getting together and really trying to force the issue to a municipality of, you need to change this practice. And so that is what we're building toward now because we think that, you know, nationally, uh, we, are a we are a country and all of our locals have been supported by access to credit. Mm -hmm. And we feel like we're in a place where if we don't start to recognize some of these risks and really push those to the forefront, as being critical to the sustainability of our credit system for municipalities, yeah. we're gonna end up with some real grave consequences, not in a 20 year horizon, but in a five, 10, 15 year horizon along the way. Sounds like you guys need a network of municipal <laughs> governments <laughs> who have an alignment on racial equity and share your values perhaps, I don't know, it's a possibility. <laughs> Do you know one? I, I, I've, I've done some work, yes. <laughs> joking behind that we were going to make some commitment and I, I think that uh, to move forward and I think what's really uh, resonates in, in all of these different uh, your different organizations is that in order to embed this racial equity no one of our institutions are the institution that has uh, the playbook right we know what we know we have the data how do we use the data how do we validate um, what works what doesn't but also how do we pull in the right players at the right time, at the right pace, right? You know, I remember when we, when we had the conversation about returning citizens, right? The whole term, the, the words that we are yeah. using to talk mm -hmm. about these communities to, you know, how are we positioning the rating agencies and how are we engaging municipalities, how we're pre preparing them. So before we end, I just want maybe quickly each of you, you know, like you're in the middle of this, you're in this, and it's, it's not perfect, right? Right? This is us taking a leap because systems change is not perfect inherently. We're trying to change a, a system that's fundamentally been in place for centuries that we all are participants of. What would you leave for, for others who are thinking about strategic partnerships to pr promote this, this, this lens of racial equity? Girl. <laughs> uh, Napoleon, why don't you go first? <laughs> sure. Um, I would, uh, we, Mm -hmm. I got some friends in the crowd, <laughs> would say that uh, a few things. One, and this is going to be very specific to our work, um, we all live in place, we all live in a community, and we all love our communities. There's no question about that. Yeah. I still rep Eastern Carolina like, you know, I didn't leave 20 years ago, you yeah. know? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. I still That's rep right. it, you know, to the core. So um, I think that we have a responsibility to really put our own sort of investment lens around the places that we live and recognizing that you know, the players that are trying to improve or change, in many cases, they, they might not sound like us, they might not look like us, they might not be pursuing things in the same way that we are, but if we could get to where we're all thinking along the same timeline, yeah. where we're not just thinking about the political window, yeah. or we're not just thinking about the municipal repayment window, or the right. budget window, or, but we're thinking along the longer term, that there's an alignment there that uh, could really help to change, and a coalition there that could really help to change some of the kind of core concerns that we have in our local communities. Um, and I would just push that out to anyone. If anybody would, is doing that sort of work now, we'd love to hear about it. Awesome. Oh, three things, I guess I'd say. One, move with courage. Uh, talking about race, not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. And at this moment, for our country in particular, a uh, very divisive topic and polarizing in a way that doesn't serve anyone. Well, maybe it does, but doesn't serve our collective good. Um, and so we have to be able to step into those spaces and recognize we may not be comfortable in them, but we have mm. to make th that progress. Second thing I'd say is um, build network uh, to the whole theme of this, cutting across collaborations. You know, when our network got New York City to join, we were thrilled at the, the think of the largest city in the country. We were thrilled when Fort Collins, Colorado joined. It's a college town just north of Denver because we know that these issues cut across p demography, they cut across mm -hmm. geography, they cut across political ideology. There's not a single place in this country that's not dealing with issues around race. Right. The last thing I would say is uh, just how we should move in the world in anything, but particularly on this issue, um, consistency, integrity, and um, Delivery, right? Be consistent in what you're talking about. Have integrity in how you do this work. Deliver on what you promise. And I think we'll find ourselves in a much better situation for the short and long term. That's right. That's right. 
And I think speaking from a perspective from corporate philanthropy, um, many times it seems like it's not okay to try something new and make a mistake, and it, it is. That's how you make lasting change, is it's okay to make a mistake, it's okay to take your time, and it's okay to ask for help. Um, as I said before, we're really good at building enterprise software. <laughs> we are not necessarily the best folks to build out a racial equity program <laughs> without a lot of help. Um, and so it's, it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to make mistakes. That's our panel. Thank you so much. You can find everybody online and have a great rest of the conference. Thanks.